You know, there's certain moments in my culinary life when everything changed, like the first time I cooked with Julia Child, and at the last minute she gave me 24 oysters to open. That didn't work out too well for me. Or more recently, I cooked with Jose Andres, the famous Spanish chef, and he showed me how to take very ordinary ingredients and turn them into something extraordinary. So today in Milk Street, we're talking about culinary magic. We're gonna make Jose's garlic bread soup. We're gonna take a pork tenderloin and turn it into a weeknight tapas dish. And finally, we're gonna take kale salad and turn it into something you really want to eat. Stay tuned and hope you enjoy the show. You're Jose Andres and I'm not. We're in your house just outside of Washington and uh, you are known, I have to say, for doing a lot of cutting edge cooking. Your heart seems to be in the simple cooking. They inhabit the same universe for you? Or, totally. or, okay. It's never been a war between avant-garde and traditional. We are always trying to push the boundaries, but what allows us to do that is that we know where we come from. Mm. What I'm making for you today Cooking. It's a little simpler. Well, this is the way my wife, myself, we cook at home. This is the, the heart of Spanish cooking. And the dish we're making today is one of my favorites, sopa de ajo, garlic soup. Uh, my father, my mother will get the check at the beginning of the month. And the refrigerator will be full of things, meat and fish, expensive things. At the end of the month, the refrigerator will be very, very empty. And I don't remember any dish from the beginning of the month. I only remember the dishes from the end of the month. And this soup, many mothers, many fathers, many families will eat it all the time. And you're gonna see, it's a super humble soup. We're gonna be using bread, one, two, three weeks old. We're gonna be using garlic, which is in essence the heart of Spanish cooking. Pimenton, or we call paprika in America. Olive oil and eggs, that's it. It's like one, two, three, four, five ingredients. And water. And six. water. Six ingredients. Not bad. So are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready. Any bread works. If one now is super hard, look at it. Super hard. All these breads are perfect. Don't worry. So never throw bread away. This is like, they are like this. Not too thick, not too thin. Then we need garlic. Everybody thinks that the Spanish food is about garlic. And he's, True, but then it's not true. It's one or two dishes that we use heavy amounts of garlic. Yeah, I asked Lydia Bastianich about this too. In Rome, if you have garlic in a dish, you don't taste it afterwards. It's very subtle. Is that the same thing as in Spain? I think it has to do also with the quality of the garlic. But the answer is yes. Here you're gonna be eating a garlic soup and at the end, probably you're gonna have a hard time recognizing the garlic flavor, mm -hmm. believe it or not. Let me show you a quick tip. Let's hope it works. So, you put it in here. If the garlic has been dry enough, just you heat it like you're making a cocktail. This is great for the kids. You give them and they're helping. Take a look what happens, okay? That the, the garlic peel. Actually worked. So now we start cooking, okay? Use a good olive oil, good virgin olive oil. If it's from Spain, better because the soup will be better, because the dish comes from a smell. I'm doing the soup as my feelings tells me. And you need to listen, because the soup is gonna talk to you. And if you listen, you don't need a recipe. So now we put it there, and we're gonna wait until the garlic dances. And in the moment he's with his favorite partner, which is olive oil, do you see one moment that the garlic guy's kind of dancing? Do you see? Come on, Okay, do it. I'll put my nose in Come on. You see? Boom, Bam. It's, that's the moment. So the garlic is telling you, I am in the right moment. Now the bread goes there and the bread is happy because it's shiny and the bread likes to be shiny and the garlic is always having a good time with everybody. So here, can you listen? Mm -hmm. it, it's, some, it's something happening there. It's a conversation happening there between all of them. 
you want that conversation. And you are trying to make sure that nobody raises the voice more than anybody else. So in this moment, we're gonna get the paprika, the pimenton. Now, is this smoked or not? What do you think? Oh, uh, yeah. Always a smoke. The smoke is almost like if we're making this in a campfire, and the beautiful mm. smoke of the campfire is going into the soup. The smokiness is an ingredient. <laughs> How much? Ah, don't be cheap. <laughs> okay, you feel it. Now we can see the smell coming. The garlic is coming up, even I can smell the bread. In this moment, we go with the water. Water is my new ingredient. And the bread is kind of becoming almost like a paste. Now I'm very happy, now I can add more. And now we're gonna wait. The garlic will kind of almost disintegrate into the soup <laughs> and that wouldn't be bad. Okay. What are like two or three things about how you think about food in Spain, which is totally different than how you think about food in Italy or France? Yeah. Probably the simplicity of flavors. We try to bring the essence of the flavor of the ingredients we cook with, that we are able to bring the subtle flavors of every ingredient forward and let those flavors, without the addition of anything else, speak for themselves. Three. And now we are going to go and we're going to whisk it very quickly. And that's it. And that's the soup, my friend. This defines what I consider to be great cooking. Just a few ingredients, simple. I've known you throughout the years as being a, a cutting edge chef. This is where your soul is. Your soul is in the simple food. Welcome to Milk Street. Are you all glad to be here? So uh, this is a story and a recipe uh, about a guy called Jose Andres. And I was cooking with him recently, and he made a garlic bread soup. About six ingredients, took maybe 20 minutes. Uh, it taught me a lot about cooking, because it was very simple, but it was also had a lot of flavor. So we brought that recipe back to Matt here at Milk Street. And you're going to dress it up a little bit, because I don't think our ingredients are quite as good as his were. Uh, but it's still a very simple soup, and you can make it w in less than half an hour. I'm also not a Michelin-starred chef, so Jose has some sort of magic that we hope to replicate with just another ingredient or two. As you said, it's garlic and bread soup. First flavoring, of course, would be the garlic. So you want to slice them really as thin as you can. I hold the clove, and I rock my fingers back. As you can see, I'm cutting the length of the garlic clove. Then when it starts getting too thin, I can roll it, the clove forwards and just keep slicing. So there's our six cloves of garlic. I'm gonna transfer that to the pot. And now let's cut some scallions. We're gonna use the whites in the soup, then we're gonna use the greens, the tops on the croutons. So we can cut the whites off, even up the tops. We can cut them at once. And just nice thin slices. And put those in the pot. And we're gonna add three tablespoons extra virgin olive oil. And we're gonna cook these really slow and low over medium low heat takes about eight to 10 minutes. You don't really want color on them. Just when they're starting to brown a little bit, it's time to proceed with the recipe. Okay. So Chris, it's been about eight minutes. So at this point, we're gonna add our paprika. So we have four teaspoons sweet paprika here and one and a half teaspoons of smoked paprika. And the interesting thing about paprika is it really starts darkening, the flavor intensifies. At this point, the paprika is browned and smelling lovely. And we're gonna add one cup of bread cubes this is gonna help thicken it and give the soup good, easy body. So we'll stir those in and coat it with the garlic and everything else. When he did it, he had a big pile of bread, which he sliced very thinly. So he, he put all the bread into the soup and you're just putting some of it in. I am. You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna fry the rest. We're gonna make croutons with it. So you get this nice contrast of soft bread melted into the soup and then crisp croutons with the scallions. So at this point, I know Jose stuck with water. We're gonna cheat. We're gonna okay. use a little bit of chicken broth base. It's kind of a paste. It's yeah. a paste, okay. and uh, you keep it in your fridge, and it's really handy for okay. quick meals like this. So just two tablespoons, we'll add that in, and then comes our water. We're gonna add six cups of water. Give it a stir to mix up that base. We're gonna increase the heat to bring it up to a simmer, then reduce it back down and let it simmer for 15 minutes to let those flavors combine. Every once in a while, you want to whisk it vigorously to help break the bread down. Okay. While the soup is simmering, we're going to make our croutons. Any loaf of bread really works well here. Jose used sourdough, 
which he sliced thinly in little wedges. I think that's one reason he didn't need a lot of other ingredients, because the bread had a lot of flavor to it. But you could use a boule like this or a baguette. For our croutons, we're going to add three tablespoons of oil, three cups of bread, cut into half-inch cubes, and now we're going to chop those scallion tops and put those in. And it's a half teaspoon of kosher salt and a half teaspoon of black pepper. You can start it all together. You want medium heat. You don't want it to brown too quickly. Otherwise, the bread's going to burn, and those scallions are going to burn too. So the croutons take about 8 to 10 minutes. You want to stir them every now and again to prevent them burning, and they'll be done by the time the soup's ready. We have our crispy croutons that I think you've had more than a few oh, of. Or what's left of them, yes. The soup simmered, smells delicious, and now we're going to add our egg yolks to really enrich it. Well, actually, Jose used whole eggs. Of course. Jose, and Jose, Jose. <laughs> he actually used whole eggs, and some of the whites actually did start to cook a little bit. So uh, we're just using yolks. I'm going to turn the heat off the soup, give it a quick whisk, and then I'm going to ladle in about a cup of the broth. I want to add this slowly so to not cook the yolks. So when we temper, we're heating those egg yolks up so they don't cook instantly. The soup is off the heat. That's pretty important here. But we're just going to, while whisking, we can pour that soup right in. Would you like to serve? I'll hold the bowl. And okay. Serve. That's my way of serving. Okay. okay, there you go. Keep them on, please. What's left of them? And this uh, liquid here is? Aged sherry vinegar. Some of us liked it with a little more acid to sharpen the flavors. To me, it really depends on the bread you're using, because if you're using really tangy sourdough or pan levain with good fermentation, it doesn't need the acid. Mm. This has so much flavor. It's mm -hmm. so simple to make. It's not garlicky, but it has the mellowness of garlic, which gives it a lot of depth. But it doesn't, I hate that aftertaste. It doesn't have that at all. No, there's nothing acrid here. So today at Milk Street, we learned something about making a very simple soup. We started with just six cloves of garlic, some bread. We make croutons separately. Some of the bread went into the soup. Lots of water, little paprika, scallions, egg yolk. And we managed in just about 20 minutes to create whole different levels of flavor to it. It's one of the great recipes of all time because it's simple and just has really terrific flavor. Thank you, Jose. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs>So, Lynn, I'm going to tell you a story about railroads, which has nothing to do with kale salad, which is the recipe we're about to do. I was in Penn Station a year ago, and I know some of the porters who work there. It's a long story. Okay. And I was talking to one of them. This guy's like my age. He's that old. And he said, yeah, you know, uh, my wife and I really enjoy kale smoothies. And I'm going like, I guess kale now is ubiquitous because everyone's cooking with it. And I never would consider making a kale salad, to be quite honest. So it's your job to... Uh, Talk me into this. I'm going to try to talk you into it. So I have a couple of ways that I'm going to convince you that this is worth it. <laughs> we took some inspiration from a Spanish topping that they use on vegetables called picada. And then we're going to do something a little later, a little secret special technique to the kale to get rid of that tough chewiness. So You're doubting me already. So to get me to eat this, you have to go all the way to Spain to bring flavor in and then do a secret technique. Yes. OK. I'm, but, I'm all ears. So I have two sliced shallots here, and then five tablespoons of sherry vinegar, and then a half a teaspoon of salt. Kosher salt? Kosher salt. So I'm just gonna whisk this together, and then we're actually gonna let it sit for about 10 minutes. So this is actually a Milk Street basic, which is you can take onions or shallots, put them in with vinegar. It's a quick pickling technique for 15 minutes or so. And then they're much softer in terms of flavor and good in salads or as a topping, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So Chris, this has been sitting for about 10 minutes. Okay. So we're gonna finish the dressing with five tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil, two tablespoons of honey, and a half a teaspoon of black pepper. And I'm just gonna whisk this, try to get it emulsified. Okay, and then we're just gonna set this aside until it's time to toss the salad. These are smoked almonds. So I'm just gonna add these to the food processor and just give them a coarse chop. That's about eight pulses. And I'm just gonna transfer this to a bowl big enough to be able to toss your salad in later because we're actually gonna add the kale to that bowl to toss later. So I was hoping that I didn't see any kale. We're gonna make a kale salad without kale. <laughs> it's coming, it's That's coming, how you do it. it's coming. The other thing important in a piccata is bread. 
So this is four ounces of ciabatta bread cut into one inch cubes. Again, we're gonna process these down to kind of a coarse crumb, somewhere in between a crouton and a, a fine bread crumb. And we're gonna add a little bit of seasoning to this. I have a tablespoon of sweet paprika, and then two teaspoons of thyme leaves, half a teaspoon of salt, and a half a teaspoon of black pepper. And then three tablespoons of olive oil so that it will get crispy when we add it the to skillet. a skillet. And then just combining this, that's all you're doing here. We don't need to grind the bread anymore. We're gonna transfer this into our 12 inch skillet. We're gonna heat it over medium heat and cook it until it's brown and crispy. That should take about 10 minutes. We took them out and put them on a plate over there so they're cool before we continue with the rest of our salad. So you can't make a kale salad without kale. I was being hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got two bunches of lacinato kale. Sometimes it's called dinosaur kale or Tuscan kale. I'm gonna finish chopping this. I just slice that thinly and transfer it to our bowl. I'm gonna add a cup of mint. We wanted a lot of herb flavor in here, so it's a whole cup of mint. So I'm gonna massage the kale. You know, I've been doing this a really long time and I never thought I'd see the day <laughs> when on our show, someone was gonna massage a hearty green. Well, so. here we are. So okay. the nuts that we have in here have some texture to them. So they're kind of abrasive. And what that will do is break down some of the fibers in the kale and soften it. So the mint flavor is coming out. You can I'll, smell I'll grant it. you that. Yeah. But <laughs> If you don't do this, so what? The kale is gonna be really chewy, tough to chew. This is gonna really make it softer. You can see that it's a lot darker than when I started. You can feel the difference. It's kind of a okay, little- Okay, come on. All right, so I'll just too try much. because so come you're, on. you're come making on. this. You can do it. Well, it is kind it's, of soft. Yeah. This feels good. It's comforting, right? I, you got to hog it the whole time. Now I know. That's how you're such a calm, lovely person. All we need to do is dress it and add those crumbs. Okay. So I'm just going to give this dressing a little bit of a whisk before we put it in here and then add it. And if you wouldn't mind grabbing those crumbs we made earlier, throw them on. And I'm just going to toss this up. Okay, it looks promising. It's not right? like big I mean, hogging pieces of kale. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. This is really good. I mean, I would actually make this. So you have the croutons, essentially the breadcrumbs, you have the nuts, you have the, obviously the shallots, the greens. It's got a lot going on, mm. but it all goes together. So today on Milk Street, we really learned something extraordinary, which uh, Lynn taught me how to make a kale salad. I would actually eat. Uh, you massage the kale, but the big thing was the texture. I think the breadcrumbs in the skillet with the paprika, a little bit of the shallots and the vinegar actually for flavor and let them sit and pickle quickly. And of course, the smoked nuts as well. So great job and uh, Thank you. kale Amazing. salads back on my repertoire. Woohoo! So Raina, we're talking tapas, which simply means small plate, or pinchos, which is also a similar term in Spain. Uh, some bars, they give them away, so you drink more, which is like salted peanuts. <laughs> Other places, of course, you'd have to pay for them. But this is a very particular style of tapas, really from the Basque region, which is pinchos moronos. And they actually used a, a skewer mm -hmm. to attach often like a piece of meat to a piece of bread, and that would be your tapas. We'd like to use that concept, but actually make a dinner out of it, right? So, pinchos morunos are, the literal translation of that term is Moorish bites impaled on small thorns or pointed sticks. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> I, I... It's, there's a lot in two words that can be said, but we're not going to fuss. In this recipe, we're not going to fuss with skewers or small sticks or definitely not thorns. The original recipe had a Moroccan spice mix called ras al hanout which basically means top of the shelf. Um, it was I love it when you say that. <laughs> it was a top five spices of any spice shopkeeper. To start this off, we're going to use one and a half teaspoons of ground coriander seed, another one and a half teaspoons of ground cumin seed, and I have here one and a half teaspoons of smoked paprika, which is going to add some lovely smoky flavor. Three quarters teaspoon each of ground black pepper. I like a coarse ground and kosher salt. 
So that's our spice blend, Chris, and then we're going to move on to our pork. So I have here a one pound piece of pork tenderloin. We're just going to trim any excess fat and silver skin off the edge. So I'm going to cut this into one to one and a half inch cubes is about the right size to get the spice mix in there and have the spices marinate the meat really nicely. Any smaller and in the cooking, the meat tends to dry up a lot. The pork is gonna go straight into our seasoning mix. And then my favorite part always is to use my hands. We're going to massage the meat and make sure all of the dry rub gets coated on all of the meat. And then once I finish this up, this is going to sit for 30 minutes to up to an hour at room temperature. And we're going to come back and make a sauce and then cook our meat. So Chris, our meat has been marinating in its dry rub for about 30 minutes. I'm going to now build a very simple dressing that's going to finish our pork dish first. I start with one clove of garlic, which I'm going to grate straight into this bowl using a fine wand style grater. To this, I'm going to add one tablespoon of lemon juice, and that's going to temper the harshness of the garlic. And then we're going to add one tablespoon of honey. It gives it a little sweetness and some body. So you're trying to temper the harshness of the garlic, and you're trying to temper the harshness of me. Because <laughs> it's a twofer, right? A little sweet and a little sour, Chris. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> OK, so this is our dressing. I'm going to ask you to please move that over that way. And to cook the pork, I'm going to use a 12 inch cast iron skillet and one tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil. And this is going to go on high heat and we're going to heat it until it just starts to smoke. So our oil has just about started to smoke. So we're ready to put our pork in. And the pork is going to go into the hot oil, stay on high heat. And we want to make sure that they're arranged in a single layer and they stay in the pan for three minutes without any other movement. I'm going to flip them over and cook them for another two to three minutes on the other side. So Chris, they've been cooking on the other side now for about another three minutes. I'm gonna turn off the heat. You see a lovely crust developed and I'm gonna rely on your superpowers to lift up this cast iron skillet. I thought you had the superpowers. That's, <laughs> that's why I hired you. In my mind. We're gonna transfer our pork into the dressing that we made. Great. So we're going to give this a quick stir. Mm. I mean, you can really you can smell, you can it. smell yeah. it from here. Yeah. It's. Um... Mm. And then just to finish it, Chris, I'm going to add a tablespoon of olive oil, extra virgin. Just drizzle that right on top. Mm. And a tablespoon of chopped fresh oregano. I mean, this is like one of the simplest recipes in the world. It looks great. Ten minutes of work, maybe. Yeah. And that's it. It makes a great weeknight dinner but it's also really good with drinks. You can help yourself to some lemon wedges. It's wonderful on top. Hmm. They have that wonderful smokiness from the paprika. They have a little bit of garlic. Yeah, I think the coriander and the cumin give it sort of that Moroccan feeling, the, the smoked paprika. Simple, but complex. So today at Milk Street, we learned how to take a simple tapas and turn it into a simple supper. We had a pork tenderloin, we did a dry rub with some salt and other spices and let it sit for about half an hour. A simple sauce of some honey, garlic, and lemon juice, and then a quick turn in a cast iron skillet. Marry it with that sauce and you're good to go and it makes a great dinner. By mm -hmm. the way, you can get this recipe, which I do recommend, and all the recipes from this season at MilkStreetTV.com. Mm -hmm.